Heavenly Father, we just praise you and thank you that uh, for allowing us to be here this morning. We thank you so much for the opportunity that is ours to study your precious word. <clears throat> and as we continue our study uh, through the uh, topical lessons in Proverbs, uh, we pray, Lord, that uh, these lessons have been uh, practical and really helpful to us and will encourage us all to live wisely. And uh, thank you for this lesson to this morning as we uh, continue our study of laziness and what that means. And uh, we praise you and thank you for uh, this opportunity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, in our journey of... Um, we're kind of winding things down or moving towards the uh, close of our study in Proverbs. Um, but um, it hasn't been a long journey. Uh, there's so many other topics that we could cover in this book, but uh, I felt that these were topics that were important. And you might recall that we began our study uh, with a basic introduction to, to Proverbs and how to study Proverbs. Um, we uh, considered wise counsel, identifying it, seeking it, and give, giving it. And by the way, if uh, you are needing uh, old uh, outlines or you didn't get one from before, uh, we have a few in the back and we can always make more copies. And then we looked at the wise man and the fool, which are you. Um, a, a few weeks ago, we looked at conflict, its causes, effects, and remedy. Um, then uh, we finished up our study uh, actually a week and a half on wisdom and wealth. We looked at um, how the wise man uh, properly views his wealth, accumulates his wealth, and uses his wealth. And then we started last week to get into our study of laziness, which is an enemy of skillful living. One thing to, to, to note is that there is no uh, absolutely correct way of uh, teaching or uh, studying the book of Proverbs. You can approach it from uh, different, different ways. I've chosen to do more a topical study uh, through Proverbs, and uh, there's other topics that we're not going to cover, but I thought these were some of the most important ones. Uh, but there's different ways, and as, as um, you know, for if you're, if you're reading through Proverbs, it's more difficult to perhaps uh, pull up all the verses and and uh, around a certain topic. So hopefully this has been helpful to you. I've been doing this for you. Um, I was talking to my brother the other day, and uh, he's teaching the book of Proverbs at his church down the road here. And he began his teaching of Proverbs uh, way before I did, about a year ago. So we were exchanging notes, and I asked him, uh, so how's it going? Well, he started up, you know, doing it virtually, and we agreed on one thing, says virtual teaching just isn't the same. And, you know, and I guess public schools are seeing that virtual teaching, you know, has more negatives than positives. So he said they did virtual teaching and it's not the same. So what he's doing in his church is he's teaching through Proverbs in the Sunday school. So I asked him, and he's doing verse by verse. So I said, I asked him, so where are you in Proverbs? Said, oh, we're up to chapter 12. So I said, well, you're probably going to take another two years to get through it. And uh, so he asked me what I'm doing. I said, well, I'm doing a topical study, and we have a few more weeks to go. But he said, you know, I, and I said, regardless of what way we teach, uh, there's a lot of uh, value to it. And he said, yeah, we, we're getting a lot of, he's getting a lot of discussion as they're going verse by verse, because the topics do change as you're going verse by verse. Um, so I, I say this, that there's no correct way or a perfect way of teaching Proverbs. I chose to do it topically. My brother does it verse by verse. Um, but it's still a valuable book because people are really, uh, like in our own class, there's a lot of discussion and comments from folks. And I've kind of reminded folks, don't look at yourself as being or having these characteristics. Okay, we study the fool. Don't, I don't want you to go out, go out, you know, leave here and say, I'm a fool. Because, you know, you're not a fool, okay? If the behaviors of a fool are characteristic of your life ongoing, yeah, then you better take a look at it and maybe make some changes. Um, same thing with how we handle our wealth. We all make mistakes. You know, we have the sin nature. We're not perfect. Um, 
And as I've emphasized over and over again, um, these studies are to just bring to our awareness perhaps behaviors that we need to change, attitudes that we need to change. But it doesn't mean that you are, you know, what I say. So laziness is another one. Okay, I know uh, there's concerns. So, wow, um, I mentioned this last week that uh, as we get older, we get really tired and we take naps. And sometimes the feeling, wow, I'm taking naps, so I must be a lazy person. No, yeah, if that's the case, I'm a lazy person. <laughs> All right. Now, if you're taking naps the entire day and the evening, and that's all you do, yeah, I think you would fit in this ca uh, category of a lazy person or a slugger. But uh, we take naps, um, and we try to refresh us, and we rest. Um, there's nothing wrong with that, okay? So um, as we get older, we take naps. we got to slow down. It takes me longer to do things that I could do faster in my younger years. Okay, so today we're going to continue our study of laziness and animal enemy of skillful living. And I mentioned last week that, and it's in your outline, that probably the easiest character for all of us to identify with in Proverbs is a sluggard or a lazy person. Uh, the reason being is that there is so much of this person in all of us. And um, though we may not exhibit his characteristics uh, to the fullest extent, uh, we can still identify with them. And I mentioned too, and it's in your outline, the Hebrew word atzal is, uh, is uh, translated sluggard or slothful or lazy one, is used only in the book of Proverbs and is not found anywhere else in the Old Testament. <clears throat> so um, the sluggard or the lazy one is one of the most pitiful characters, uh, characters in Proverbs, and yet he is one whom all of us can easily identify with. So, uh, last week, um, we began our study of the description of the sluggard, and we'll finish up that section, and then we'll go on to the advice of the sluggard and the remedy for the sluggard, okay? So, you might recall um, in your outline, uh, Roman numeral one, letter A, the sluggard is an irritation to those who employ him. And in Proverbs 10, 26, we read there, like vinegar to the teeth and smoke to the eyes, so is a lazy one to those who send him. And so uh, we find here that smoke to the eyes and vinegar to the te teeth uh, are examples of things which are irritating. Okay? Uh, I don't know if you've ever just gulped some uh, vinegar and, and held it in your mouth for a while. Uh, we all know smoke, you know. I asked last week, how many of you have had smoke in your eyes? Well, Nathan is you know, fighting fires, you know, so, and uh, I've had that experience too, when arsonists set fire to my car, you know, you ran into the smoke, and uh, it's so irritating. So we have illustration here, or when you barbecue, you know when you barbecue and you're, you're lighting the coals and the wind blows into your eyes, you know, it's irritating. So what this proverb tells us is that um, those who send a person on an errand. So the implication is that someone has hired someone else to run an errand for him or her. Okay? And so um, the lazy, the sluggard person, the sluggard is an irritation to the one who employs that individual. Okay? Why? Because the person goes uh, and is supposed to do an errand but never does it or uh, takes several hours to do something that could be done in um, uh, an hour or less. So uh, we have the, the term uh, setting our teeth on edge, set your teeth on edge. So that's an expression that we can use for ourselves when we look at an irritation um, being, you know, uh, uh, being centered or coming from a person who is a sluggard. So those who sent him uh, show that he has been employed with regret to do some errand. So perhaps in your own work situation, if you were a boss or whatever, or maybe you knew a coworker, and they were sent on an errand and uh, it took forever for them to do it, uh, you know how much of an irritation it might be to you as well as to the employer or the boss. Then we looked at the, the sluggard has nothing in life but wishes. In the chapter 13, verse 4, we read, The soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing, but the soul of the diligent is made fat. So what we have here is that the sluggard, the lazy person, the slothful, 
is one who desires things but has no prospect of fulfillment. And if you want things, uh, you must work for them. Uh, my mother, whenever we we're growing up, my brothers and I, we would talk about our dreams and the things that we wanted to do when we got older. Or even at that time as we are in elementary school, say, oh, we want to do this. And I remember my mother over and over again says, wishful thinking will get you nowhere. And I remember that. She would drill that into our head. Wishful thinking will get you nowhere. Okay, if you just talk about it, you wish for it without putting forth the effort. And so uh, we, we have here, back in Solomon's time, that wishful thinking will never replace hard work. If you want things, uh, you need to work for it. Okay? And so, but the sluggard uh, has nothing in life but wishes. And then we saw that... Uh, I was working off the outline I gave you, so I should go to my regular notes. Okay, then the slugger wastes his life through procrastination. If you turn to chapter 24, verses uh, 30 to 34, Proverbs 24, verses 30 to 34. This is a story that I mentioned last week. It comes from a farmer's field in Palestine. Proverbs 24, verses 30 to 34. <clears throat> I passed by the field of a sluggard and by the vineyard of the man lacking sense. And behold, it was completely overgrown with thistles, its, sur its surface was covered with nettles, and a stone wall was broken down. When I saw, I reflected upon it. I looked and received instruction. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. Then your poverty will come as a robber and your man like an armed man. Okay, so I pointed out last week that in this passage, uh, we have what we uh, often refer to as thought parallelism, which is a characteristic of Hebrew poetry. Okay, as I mentioned before, Hebrew poetry is not rhyme, it's not meter, but it's the, the connection of thoughts. So one part of a, a passage will define what follows or vice versa. A second phrase in the passage will define um, what has been said. So when we read verse 30, I passed by the fields of a sluggard and the, by the vineyard of a man lacking sense. So the field here is a vineyard. Okay? The field is a vineyard and the sluggard is defined as one who is lacking sense. Okay? So you have a vineyard and then you have a, a person who is lacking sense. So uh, another way, literally when you say lacking sense, the Hebrew word is heart. So lacking heart. So um, we have the observation here that a slugger's vineyard is overgrown with thistles and weeds, and the stone wall is broken down. And the initial lesson for all of us is um, to ask ourselves is, what do other people see when they drive by our homes? If you want to apply it in a practical way. Uh, if your yard has a lot of weeds, uh, trash all over the place, uh, your house is uh, falling apart, uh, what do people think about who lives in that house? Okay, So you have uh, this passerby, he sees this vineyard, it's full of weeds and, and thistles. And he wonders what kind of person owns this field. Okay, So if you apply it to ourselves, look at where you live. You know, in, in my neighborhood, sometimes you see all these weeds, and wow, well, you know, uh, it's a nice thing that our association doesn't allow uh, junk cars, <laughs> okay. Uh, they're always being cited for uh, leaving uh, uh, deserted cars, but but the, the initial lesson, the practical lesson for all of us is, what do people think of us when they see our property? Okay, and Solomon here stops and observes that poverty, poverty comes to the man through a little folding of the hands to rest. Okay, so this is something which the person does from time to time. This is a character, an ongoing characteristic of, of this individual. The sluggard gets his uh, vineyard started, but he never weeds it. Why? Well, after, it's, it's work. Okay, so he doesn't want to do any work. So what does he have? He has a harvest of weeds. Okay, there's nothing to show for his labor. And we find here that if a sluggard, if he starts a job, 
never finishes it. His life is full of unfinished jobs. So what begins with a little, you know, when you, you sit down in a chair and you're resting and you kind of, you know, what are you doing? You're, you're showing him, I'm tired, I'm just going to rest and take it easy, okay? And then you, before you know it, you fall asleep, all right? And you fall asleep. And where some people will look at their hands and they'll play with their hands and they fall asleep. Okay, my granddaughter was over yesterday and says, Papa, can I take a nap on your bed? I said, sure. And I said, can you turn the air conditioning on? I said, sure. And then, so I said, okay, I'm going to take a nap too, Julia, because I'm really tired. So I lay down, I looked at her, she was playing with her, her hands, and <laughs> whatever, and then before I know it, she was out. Okay, well, the same thing here. You know, you sit down in the chair and you're kind of going like this here. Uh, before you know it, you're asleep. All right. So that's the picture we have. Again, Proverbs tells us, it, it reminds us that the things that we see today were present in Solomon's time. Okay? The same kinds of issues, same kinds of problems, same kinds of situations. So there's nothing new. Nothing has changed over the centuries. But you have a little folding of the hands to rest. And the result is that because this is a way of life for the slugger, for the lazy person, for the slothful person, um, nothing is accomplished okay so he wastes his life through procrastination uh, chapter 15 this is uh, we ended with uh, the sluggard wastes his life through procrastination so we'll we'll continue now um, under letter d or letter d in your outline the sluggard makes life difficult for himself go back to chapter 15 verse 19. chapter 15 verse 19. The way of the lazy is as a hedge of thorns, but the path of the upright is a highway. Okay, so what does this um, tell us? When you, when you look at this passage here, it's just a reminder that man reaps what he sows. Okay, man reaps what he sows. Uh, the lazy man who fails to do his job right the first time by clearing a proper path now finds the work even more difficult the second time around. Why? Because, because thorns and a hedge block his way. So uh, when you look deeper into this, a slugger, a slothful person, is always looking for shortcuts in any work that may be forced upon him. So as a result, he always has to back up and do over what could have been done right in the first place had he only been diligent. Okay. Um, I, I've shared this before, when I was in high school and my first three years of college, I worked summers at a uh, sign company in Kalihi. And uh, the boss's son was hired, we were the same age, and the boss would hire a lot of the young guys, okay. And uh, uh, one of the, eventually my, my specialty was cutting plastics on wood. You know, you have signs, you cut out plastics and you glue them on a face thing. And when I first started, the first day, I was asked to cut out a sign for a bar, okay, cocktails. And uh, the only, only workshop or shop class I took was in the eighth grade. So we had this stationary jigsaw, and I cut that, the, the lettering out off the template. And man, was it crooked, it was jagged. And so uh, the boss's, uh, um, what is it, son-in-law, he came in and he just said, okay, we'll file it down. So he, he filed it down, made us we'll use a sander. And it took a lot of time to do, because I was inexperienced. Well, three years later, uh, whenever I had to cut letters out, I uh, used a stationary jigsaw. I found that if you just go really, really slow, when you go slow, you cut it nicely, you cut it straight, and uh, it's smooth. Okay, so at the end, everybody said, if there's a sign made, let Paul do it because he's going to do it one time and it takes a while. And so, but you didn't have to go back. Then there was another guy who came and said, well, let me cut, cut, you know, let me cut the sign. I said, no, I'll do it. So no, let me cut it. So he cut it and it's been a lot of time. I had to go back and just have to sand it down, file it down. And then uh, there was a case, a, a situation, a time that we had to do it all over again. Okay. And plastics were expensive back in the 60s. Okay, a sheet four by six was like twenty dollars. You might think, oh, that's cheap. That was really expensive. So if you wasted plastic, um, it wasn't good. The boss wasn't happy. So there are times when we need to just slow down, take your time, do it right the first time, so that you don't have to waste a lot of time and money and energy redoing something. 
Because that's the lesson that we have, the practical lesson application for us today. You know, the slugger makes life difficult for himself. Why? Because he looks for shortcuts. He tries to do it quickly without doing it right the first time. So he has to spend more time uh, correcting what he could have done right in the first place. Okay. So that's the, the lesson for us today. And in contrast to this sluggard in chapter 15, verse 19, we have the upright person or the, the righteous man or the person who is um, diligent. Uh, he is prepared well by working hard. And so he makes good time because he does his work correctly the first time. He doesn't have to go back. Okay, then we have a, a series, um, letter E. We have a, three, three passages that tell us a similar thing is that the slugger never finishes what he starts. In chapter 12, verse 27, chapter 12, verse 27, We read in chapter 12, verse 27. Uh, I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. A lazy man does not roast his prey, but the precious possession of a man is diligence. Okay, now the Hebrew translation of the Hebrew word would be uh, slackness, slackness. So it would be the same thing as a lazy person. Slackness does not catch his prey. Slackness does not catch his prey. Okay, but the New American Standard translation, a lazy man does not roast his prey. Um, so, what we have here is that a lazy man does not roast that which he has killed in hunting. Uh, he manages to get his gear together for hunting, and um, he even goes out and brings home some game. But then he soon tires, takes a little sleep, procrastinates, and never butchers the deer. So what happens to the deer? It spoils. Okay. Now, when I was in college my senior year, uh, right before Thanksgiving, some other students from Hawaii went out hunting, and they bagged two deer. Okay, so they field dressed it. They brought it back, and they were living in a uh, like a duplex. So they had this carport with this shed, um, and it was empty. So they skinned the deer and they hung it up. And they said, I guess it's to cure it, right? You know, if you if any of you know about it. So they said they were curing it. Um, then they said, Well, on Thanksgiving Day, uh, we're going to go ahead and clean it, you know, we're going to butcher it, clean it, package it. So, Paul, you want to come over and help us? I said, sure. I don't have anything else to do. Uh, I'll come over and help you. And so we spent the day just butchering the deer, packaging it, stew meat, steaks, loins, whatever. Okay, hamburger, we made hamburger. And then they gave me a whole bunch of meat because I helped them. Okay. I ended up throwing out the stew meat because it was terrible. It was so gamey. My roommate and I, he was from Hawaii, we made some stew and said we couldn't eat this thing. <laughs> so my other friend came and he had, I had some steaks and said, hey, Steve, you want this? He was from Oregon. You want the steak? Because this was, the, the stew was terrible. He said, let me teach you how to cook it. So he cooked the steak and said, wow, it was great. You know, so, but I remember my friend saying, we hung the deer. After three days, we need to butcher it. Because if we don't do it, it's going to spoil quickly. Okay, and so uh, we worked hard on that Thanksgiving day. Well, it's the same thing here. You know, a slugger uh, needs to change his ways and get things done quickly uh, in a timely manner. So this hunter, this person, a lazy man, does not roast that which he has killed in hunting. So eventually it spoils. Now, chapter 19, verse 24, and chapter 26, verse 15, present another picture of uh, someone who quits in the middle of a job. <clears throat> Look at chapter 19, verse 24. It says, A slugger buries his hand in the dish, but will not even bring it back to his mouth. Okay, The slugger buries his hand in the dish, but will not even bring it back to his mouth. And if you go over to chapter 26, verse 15, Chapter 26, verse 15, the slugger buries his hand in the dish. He is weary of bringing it to his mouth again. Okay. So what do we have here? Here we have a picture of a slothful person, a lazy person. He reaches his hand into a dish of food. Okay. Back in the Middle East, they use hands, okay? Uh, not forks and knives, but they use their hands. So he reaches into the dish to get some food, 
but he's so lazy, he doesn't have the strength or whatever, the energy to bring into his mouth to eat, okay? So when you apply that, you can look at it today, uh, you have people who want other people to do everything for them, okay? Uh, oh, I can do it, but uh, you know, I just don't have the, the strength. Can you do it for me? Well, they're able to do it. You know, so the practical applications, you have a person who's capable, but they're so lazy, they, they're so slothful that you know, they don't have that willpower, the discipline to do it for themselves. Okay? But back in the Middle East, back in the Middle East, that's what was an observation. Remember, Proverbs is a, is a book of observations. Okay, so you had people who were so lazy, they put their hand in the dish and they were lazy, they, they, they couldn't bring it to their mouth. Okay, sounds silly, but hey, that's the, you know, we have um, similar situations, applications today. Okay. Any questions, any, any thoughts, any, any, anybody have any comments so far? Okay. Now, if you're like this here, and it only happens once in a while, don't worry about it, okay? Don't put yourself down. Okay, please don't do that. Please don't say, Paul said I'm a lazy person, okay? Because you're not a lazy person, <laughs> all right? We're all like that, you know? Um, uh, being lazy is one of the pleasures of life, okay? It, it really is. If, if, if you didn't have to go to work, or if you didn't have to do anything, you could just say, here's your assignment for today. Just be lazy, just do whatever you want to do, okay? And I've talked to people before. Some people say, I'll sleep all day or they watch television all day. Um, you know, take the garbage out, no way, you know, that's work, right? But we all, you know, like to do it. We procrastinate and say, oh, I'll just do it later. Okay, I'll just do it later, okay? So, so it comes out to letter F. The sluggard uses every available excuse to avoid work. Uh, go to chapter 20, verse four. Chapter 20, verse four. The sluggard does not plow after the autumn, so he begs during the harvest and has nothing. Okay. So the sluggard carefully limits his working time. He, he limits his working time. He does nothing uh, after it begins to get cold. So what is his excuse here? Uh, in this setting in Palestine, it's cold weather. The stiff cold breeze is more than he cares to face. Now, when you look at this verse here, uh, you get some clue as to life in the Middle East, ancient Middle East. In the Middle East, the right time to plow and plant is after autumn, okay? And the seasons are a little different there, but um, the time after autumn is uh, usually the, the cold and rainy season. Uh, and it's chilly, it's messy, uh, it's a muddy chore, but if a man misses the right time uh, for planting, he's not gonna reap anything when it's time for harvest, okay? So, so what the, the end result is that he misses the harvest because he is so lazy, he doesn't go out there and work when the weather is bad. And so when it comes time to harvest, he has nothing. So he begs, he asks people for food, but he doesn't get any sympathy. Okay, so that's a appropriate response. So by his own laziness, he chooses his fate. Uh, so the advice there is let him beg. Okay, go over to chapter 22. Chapter 22, verse 13. The sluggard says, there is a lion outside. I will be killed in the streets. Okay. So, the only thing that works for a sluggard is an active imagination. Okay. You know, maybe you know people like that. Or maybe you've, you've done that too. Um, he says, you know, I can't go to work today because there is a lion outside. I might go out, I might get killed. Okay. Or... Uh, boy, it's, it's raining cats and dogs, it's raining outside. What if I go out there and I'm going down Cam Highway and a boulder comes down from the side of the mountain, hits me and kills me. Uh, you know what, to be safe, I'm gonna stay at home, okay? Same kind of thing today. And you know, you might know people who come up with excuses, or it's too rainy outside, or you know, the weather isn't nice, or whatever. And uh, uh, so he can't go to work because, um, uh, there's a threat outside, and he justifies staying indoors, and of course, away from work. You see how this, how practical Proverbs is? You know, you can look, we can look at uh, Old Testament or ancient Middle Eastern um, uh, life and then apply it to us today. 
Okay, let's move on to the advice to the sluggard. Advice to the sluggard. Roman numeral two. And I have here, consider the ant. Consider the ant. Okay. Now, in Job chapter 12, verses 7 and 8, as um, Job is uh, rebutting his uh, so-called friends, um, you know, he says that we are, you know, the beasts and the birds and the fish of the sea are to be consulted for instruction. There's a lot that we can learn from the animal world. Uh, one of the courses that I took in my major in college was uh, animal behavior. And it was fascinating, you know, whether uh, we uh, uh, looked at the behavior of the octopus or uh, we did actual work with uh, uh, rats and uh, pigeons. And, but if you look at the, uh, the behavior of animals, uh, there's a lot that we can, we can learn. In Proverbs chapter 6, verses 6 through 8, we have this, um, this um, description here about the ant. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 6 to 8. Go to the ant, O sluggard, observe her ways and be wise, which, having no chief, officer, or ruler, prepares her food in the summer and gathers her provision in the harvest. How long will you lie down, O sluggard, when you arise from your sleep? And then here we have this, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, your poverty will come in like a vagabond and your need like an armed man. Okay, so I read um, a little more here. Uh, the same instruction is given in chapter 30, verse uh, 25. So we have here that the ant is characterized by, by three things. Uh, it's characterized by industry, it's characterized by foresight, and characterized by preparation. Okay, industry is in your outline, so I'm not going to write it down, but it's industry, foresight, and preparation. And so it's from these characteristics that wisdom can be found in order to live life skillfully. And lazy people can learn a lesson from simply watching how hard the ant works. Uh, it never seems to rest, unlike the slugger who wastes so much time. Uh, how many of you have problems with ants in your home? Okay, we all do. Okay, every day I go outside of the house, and I usually see two trails of ants. One either coming up to uh, my bedroom, and the other one coming to the, my office. Okay, and sometimes I'll just spend time watching the ants. You notice how they go up and some are coming down. They always kind of like it seems like they're kissing each other, right? They, and so if you kill one, they're like they're confused. They don't they don't know you know where to go because they don't they don't have the connection. Okay, and if I get a raid, get the raid, and I kill a couple, oh, they're they're crazy. They don't have, they have no idea. The line is no longer there. Okay, but they're all, they always seem to be in movement. Okay, they always seem to be moving, uh, headed in a direction. I don't, know, hopefully not in the house, but uh, sometimes they come in there. But um, you look, you know, sometimes just pay attention and and, and observe uh, how the ants behave. Okay. And we have in, in this passage here, then in chapter 6, uh, verse 6, her ways, that phrase there, the two words, her ways, refers to her manner of life or her habits. And then in chapter 6, verses 7 and 8, we find that the, the ant is a self-starter. Uh, there is no chief, there is no officer or ruler. In other words, no one has to stand over the ant to make sure that she prepares and performs the tasks that are necessary. Okay. Now, the Hebrew word that is translated officer um, is the same word that is found in Exodus chapter 5, verses 6, 10, and 14, in reference to the taskmasters that the Egyptians set over the Israelites to drive them to gather straw in order to make bricks. Okay. With the ant, there is no need for a taskmaster. They just go about doing their work and why? Because they're self-motivated. Okay. And then you, when you go to chapter 30, chapter 30, verse 25, <clears throat> chapter 30, verse 25, the ants are not a strong people, but they prepare their food in the summer. Okay. So I'm just going to say here that the ant is able to distinguish time. The ant is able to distinguish time. 
So in preparing her food for the summer, uh, she recognizes that winter is coming and that there is a difference between winter and summer. Now, to the slugger, to the lazy person, uh, there's no differentiation of time. Okay? Uh, all time is alike. And putting things off until tomorrow is the best of all. So the slugger waits for the crisis to come before acting or reacting, whereas the ant foresees a crisis. This will be winter and acts to prepare now during the summer. In ancient Palestine, I'm sure today too, there are two types of ants, the brown and the black. And both ants are seed feeders. They feed on seeds. And for them, it is necessary to get the grain in the summer when it is available or die when winter comes. Okay, so the ant sees the afterwards and uh, the results of her conduct. And so the actions of today all have an afterwards or result attached. But for the sluggard, there is no difference. Okay. Sometime I would encourage you to go through the Bible, and especially through Proverbs, and just do a study of the animals. You know, throughout the Old Testament, let's do a study of the animals. And um, I did a study once, and I, I, I gave a presentation once, I can't remember, it was, maybe it was a church, on the various animals in the Bible. And there's a lot that we can learn from these animals. Okay? But here in Proverbs, we find the ant is singled out as a good example of diligence, of hard work, of um, uh, foreseeing the future and acting now instead of waiting for a problem to come up or waiting for the crisis to come. Okay, so and when we look at I, I read chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. <clears throat> How long will you lie down, O sluggard? When will you ri arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. Your poverty will come in like a vagabond, and your need like an armed man. Okay, so what is this passage uh, teaching us here? The sluggard is asked, How long? Okay, how long and when? So two times this lazy person is asked, when is he going to get going? Okay. Now notice how the, he doesn't reply never. He never replies never. He doesn't say never. All he wants is a little more time. Okay. You know, you might miss that when you read that, but you know, he says, you know, he doesn't say, I'm never gonna do it. No, I don't, I'm never gonna get going. He says, oh, just give me a little more time to rest and relax and do nothing. So what happens here is he surrenders the opportunities of life an inch at a time. Uh, he procrastinates so frequently that he does not realize that life is slipping away. So again, there is nothing wrong with taking a nap, <laughs> okay? There's nothing wrong with taking a nap um, once in a while or taking a nap in the afternoon. But when naps intrude, on the best hours of the working day, then something is wrong. You know, why do we take naps? Why do you take naps other than being tired? You know, what's your, what's your long-term goal when you take a nap? It's to feel refreshed, right? You know, if you take a nap, okay, so then later on, oh, I, can, I can do more work, okay? I can do more things, accomplish more. So the intended purpose of sleep uh, or napping is to refresh us for uh, continued effort and uh, productivity. Okay. But the sluggard does not hear such truth. Why doesn't he hear such truth? Because he's asleep. Okay, He's asleep a lot of the time. So what is the end of the sluggard? Verse 11 tells us it's uh, sudden poverty. Sudden poverty. Uh, the vagabond here in the New American Standard Bible literally is one who walks. Okay, One who walks and an armed man is a man with a shield. Okay. So the picture here is um, the sluggard doesn't take advantage of all the opportunities available to him. So you have somebody else who comes in, walks in, takes what he has, and just walks out away. Okay, that's the picture. That's the picture of the vagabond. Okay, the sluggard doesn't do anything. So while he's sleeping, somebody else comes in, just walks in, grabs and, and leaves. Okay? And then you have the, um, the, the, the soldier who plunders and ravages the town. So... Um, this is an indication that Slugger faces not only poverty, but this poverty is swift and devastating. The same idea is found in Proverbs 24, verse 34. Then your poverty will come as a robber or a vagabond, 
and your want like an armed man or a man with a shield. So we see here that the sluggard robs himself by wasting away his time, his talents, and earning power. So precious hours, important opportunities, and years of productivity are wasted because he is lazy. Okay. And in your outline, I put down this thought. Few men may be as lazy as a sluggard, yet few of us work as hard as we should. Nobody works as hard as an ant. Okay, so just think about that. You know, few men may be as lazy as a sluggard. You know, we could say we're not sluggards, we're not lazy, we're not slothful. And yet, uh, we, we do waste time. We do procrastinate more than we should. And so few of us work as hard as we should, but nobody works as hard as an ant. Okay. So, let's just go to Roman numeral three and then I'll just open up to any questions or comments or uh, feedback you have. What's the remedy for the sluggard? Well, I listed three here. Distinguish between what needs to be done and what you would like to do. Put it in writing and commit yourself to them. Reward yourself for each task you complete and remove from your list. Okay, how many of you uh, keep lists or write lists of things that you need to get done? Okay, yeah, I do. It's something I've done since uh, high school. Okay, and I do to this day. You know, I, I have, uh, finally, I have a smartphone, <laughs> okay? But putting in the calendar and the things there is kind of irritating because the alarm goes off like the day before or whatever, or 10 minutes before. But I use, uh, I have a planner that I use, I've used uh, for all these years, all right? It's good to have a list of things that you need to do, you prioritize, and then you mark it off. This is something I learned, I don't know if it'll, I'll apply to you, but something that I learned in, as a psychology major, okay? Uh, and I've applied it with young children in other situations. I apply it to myself every single day. Um, we talk about positive reinforcement. People don't like to talk about positive reinforcement because, oh, that's behavior modification. Okay, no, you know, yeah, that's true, but positive reinforcement. If you have something that you need to do, and especially something you don't want to do, you do it first, but then you work a reward for yourself. Okay, one of my pleasures in life is to, about midday, sit down in front of the, uh, at the kitchen or the dining room table and a good cup of uh, Pete's coffee. And I'm looking outside in the back and I see the birds coming because I keep the dishes full of water and then Carol will put some uh, papaya peels out there and the birds will come. And I just enjoy doing that, okay? But that's my reward. But if I have other things like, I gotta get the laundry started first. Okay, I gotta you know, pick up some hibiscus fronds outside, uh, make sure everything is going first. I'll do that first. Even though I wanna sit down and have a cup of coffee and watch the birds, I'll do that first, okay? Or if I'm studying late at night, so okay, I'm working and uh, I said, well, I'd like to take a break and have a cup of coffee or whatever. And yes, I drink coffee at night, but it helps me to sleep, okay? So, so, you know, I want to have a cup of coffee or a snack. Uh, I'll say, no, I'm gonna do this first, study for another 15 minutes, then I'm gonna reward myself, okay? I've had children come and say, oh, can I get my reward first and I'll do the work later? I said, no, it doesn't work. I, I told parents, it doesn't work when you do it that way. Okay, you're gonna reward your children for doing nothing, for not doing your work. So you, you, you make sure they do their work first. Well, a practical thing here is, yeah, you have things to do. You have, you have lists of things to do. Mark them up, but reward yourself. Reward yourself with something that you like. You know, maybe it's a cup of coffee or a piece of candy or, or uh, being able to go outside for a little while, just walk around. Whatever you enjoy doing, you work that into your schedule. And um, this is something I learned when I was a psych major and I've used not only as I work with people, but for myself. You know, reward yourself after you get things, done, especially things that uh, are not you know, pleasant to do at times, okay? And tied into that is put the things that need to be done first on your list of priorities, prioritize. I think all of us would agree that we enjoy, we would rather do the things we enjoy rather than the things we don't enjoy. But there's a satisfaction when you get the things that you don't enjoy out of the way. They don't have to worry about. I see some heads nodding, so I think you agree with me. You know, you, you just put do those things you don't enjoy 
and then you can work on the things that you enjoy. So uh, that's something I do too, you know. So I, I would encourage you to do that. And schedule the time needed so that you can accomplish your goals. Okay. After all, conquering laziness is really a matter of obedience, but um, uh, you need to allow enough time for you to accomplish uh, your goals. Okay, so uh, that's, that's the end of our study on laziness. Uh, uh, any questions, any thoughts, uh, anything you'd like to share, experiences or whatever that could, <laughs> that could help others? Okay, we're going to have three more lessons um, uh, in Proverbs next week, and I'll, I'll, in fact, when I do that, when I pass out the outline, so you can look at it for next week, someone closer than a brother, a true friend, we're going to look at that, okay, so um, I hope we have enough copies, if not, we'll make more copies, someone closer than a brother, a true friend, we'll look at what Proverbs teaches about that, so that'll be next week, and then I'm going to spend two weeks, two Sundays on um, raising your children to be wise. Okay. Um, one of the things I, I appreciated in seminary is that when I took Old Testament poetic books and we studied Proverbs, um, our professor wasn't uh, just intent on teaching us or having us uh, work through the language of the Hebrew and, and understanding the passage, but he said he gave us assignments. I want you to do an assignment on, uh, take a topic from Proverbs, and how would you teach it to people in your church? So I took the topic of child rearing, raising your children to be wise, and so I've reworked it over the years. So for the last two weeks, after a true friend next week, the last two weeks we'll look at raising your children to be wise. We can say raising your grandchildren to be wise. And so that will be a product of uh, the work and the research I did, and we'll, we'll finish it up. So another three weeks, so about the third, third or third week in July, or the oh, close to the last week in July, we'll finish out the study on Proverbs, okay, before we move on. But um, the lesson on the true friend, um, you'll find here that the same Hebrew word in, in Proverbs is uh, translated friend, uh, could be a, it could be a neighbor, a uh, companion, a chance acquaintance. So there's various definitions of the Hebrew word that's translated friend. So I'm going to be focusing on the words that uh, we, there are things, there are, there are characteristics of a friend that we can learn from um, whatever the translation is. Okay? So if you have an uh, acquaintance or a close acquaintance, a neighbor, the same principles that can apply to a true friend. So we're going to look at uh, what a true friend really is. And more importantly, you can ask yourself, are you a true friend to other people? We all want friends, and hopefully we would like to be friends to others, but um, sometimes we, we throw that word loosely. You know, we throw that word around. Oh, he's my friend, or I'm, I'm his friend. But this is going to show us what a true friend really is. So that will be next week, and then we'll spend two weeks on uh, uh, raising your children to be wise. Okay, any, any thoughts, any questions? Okay. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. We'll finish a little early today. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for our today's lesson. Thank you so much, Father, for uh, the practical reminders for us. We understand that uh, the same kinds of situations, the same kinds of problems that we experienced today were common in ancient Palestine. And we thank you for that, Lord. We thank you that we can learn from uh, the writings of Solomon and the other writers uh, of the book of Proverbs, Lord. And we just pray that in everything that we study, everything that we've learned up to now and in the last few weeks of our study in Proverbs, that uh, we will use what we study so that we will live lives wisely, we will live lives uh, skillfully. And uh, thank you again for this time. Thank you for the, the value that uh, we've already seen from the study in the book of Proverbs. And uh, we just praise you and thank you for these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.